In Mark chapter 4, verse 21. <clears throat> now Mark looks at Jesus Christ, the servant. Mark looks for Jesus Christ, the doer of God's will, going to the cross. There's a lot that you don't find in Mark that you find in the other Gospels. And he said unto them, Is a candle brought to be put under a bushel or under a vet? And not to be set on a candlestick. And you take a light. Now Matthew said, you know, we are the, the, the lighthouse. Though it's Jerusalem. <coughs> Is the lighthouse, not the Christian. But if you want to spiritual apply it. And he says, you know, we are uh, the light for the people. Mark looks at, okay, if you're the light. And you'll hear many people, if, if you're witnessing and everything like that. You'll hear many people say, well, I let my light shine. Do they know about the gospel of Jesus Christ? Do they even know you're a Christian? Are you a secret Christian? And that's what putting the light under the bushel under the bed. All right, you're saved. You're a Christian. You just don't tell anybody. That's what not a Christian's to be. Jesus said, go in the world and preach the gospel. You're to shine forth. You're, you're to... to eliminate Christ it's remarkable because when you do stand up for Jesus Christ you don't have to put on well I let my light shine on you can have people all around you acknowledge I mean I'll, I'll go through my prayer book and I got names in there and be somebody we met at Publix and you know guys come up to hey listen can we pray I need prayer Somebody might be in a grocery store or some kind of store and say, hey, that's a nice car you got out there. It's like, wait a minute. I didn't say nothing. I didn't do nothing. I, yeah, my car is loaded with bumper stickers, but, you know, I don't walk around with a sign saying, hey, that's my car, and people will recognize you. That's the light. People will look at you and say, hey, you know what? You're odd. You're weird. You're something. That's what Paul says a Christian is to be. And people will say, you know, I let my light shine and all that. You, you're just covering up. Because let me, if I was in a public ministry again with my health and all that, I, I, the next person that said, well, I let my light shine, I said, all right, give me the address where you work. And on Monday morning, I'm going to go to your workplace. I'm going to let you know because I don't want to think you're harassing you. I want to have a little talk with your boss on your conduct. I want to have a talk with your coworkers. And then I want to go talk to your family. You let your light shine. No, it's... You have no idea what the light is. And many Christians today, they have an artificial light. See, a candle is not... It's real. It's a fire. It's not artificial. An artificial light, Christians have today. I'm sorry. If you come to church, we hear the preaching... We hear a preacher, you hear our preacher, we're going to have a guest preacher, we're going to have, you know, monkey two and three and four come to our church and all that. Will you? They're going to have a special group, we're going to have a special thing and all that. Can you come? That's an artificial light. And I've always said, you know, okay, you buy them in the church, well, how do you know that message is going to be about the gospel? I would hate to invite your lost whoever you know. They come to church and you hear about the spiritual battle of David and Goliath. Well, that ain't your unsafe friend. Or we're going to look at how he perverted the Bible. And, uh, that's not really for your unsafe friend. What is for your unsafe friend is Jesus Christ suffered and died and was buried and rose again the third day. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. And it's that plain and simple. It don't need to be complicated. You know, a light on a candle does not try to be anything else. It's not a light that's going to light up a whole harbor. 
It's a light that, that sits on the table and you can eat a meal. Maybe you can read a book by it. And that's all it, that's all it wants to be. And the problem with many Christians today, they want to be this great, big, high being. And all you are is a nuisance to other drivers. For there is nothing hid which shall not be manifested. Neither is there anything kept secret but that shall come abroad. Now we're looking at a light here is everything in our life is going to be revealed outside of what has been confessed by the blood of Jesus Christ. If there is any sin that you have not confessed, if there is no salvation in Jesus Christ, everything is going to be made manifest. And you find this in John chapter 3. Men love darkness and they hate the light because the light shows who they are. And I have a message called, men are as cockroaches. You turn that light on, boom, they run. That's what sinners do. That's why they don't like to preach in the cross. That's why they don't like to preach in Jesus. Because it shows who they are, and religion will hide. <clears throat> but... Rightfully confess, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all righteousness. That will never be revealed anymore. And, you know, you think about the judgment seat of Christ for a Christian. Let's bring this to the Christian. There are tons of sins that I and you do not confess. That would be brought. There are plenty of things we do every day that needs to be confessed, and we don't. And then one of the things is churches are not preaching about sins, and there's no light because the church is not casting the light, but Christ will cast the light because you have the scriptures from Adam and Eve to the rapture of the church. We've got all kinds of individuals, characters to study and circumstances of saved and, 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 you know, Old Testament or New Testament sense, and lost people that we ought to be learning, that we ought not to be doing. Now, I, I'll give you one illustration, and I'm not going to mention the little guy with the bunnies and stuff like that. I'm not going to say that star. We ought to know by a story in the Bible, right or wrong. And when you have churches come up and they got face painting, you say, okay, what's the Bible say about face painting? It doesn't say anything about face painting. It says Jezebel painted her face. Now, come on, you really want to model your daughter after Jezebel? How many names have you ever met in your lifetime? Somebody named Jezebel, somebody named Judas or Cain. And I'm sorry to tell you in today's Baptist churches, Jezebel's spirit is in the Bible-believing King James Baptist Church. And the Bible speaks about in Revelation about the churches that Jezebel is there. And it's almost sickening some of what these women, these girls, these Christian young ladies. And then what you do with their children is a Jezebel spirit. And the Bible says, hey, learn from Jezebel. You take all those kind of care. How about you take the Bible correction? The original sin is Eve corrected the word of God. She added, she subtracted, she added her own footnotes. And how many Bible perversions do you have out and more to come before Jesus comes? Well, everyone who's involved with face painting is going to stand at the judgment seat of Christ that are saved and say, well, what about Jezebel? Well, I didn't think. And then the pastor's going to call up, why didn't you, why'd you allow that? And a lot of these pastors are going to be, why'd you allow that in your church? Well, uh, 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 uh. you didn't know that Esther was, there he goes again. Well, you know, the scholars say they don't really know. I don't care what your scholars say. Half of them going to hell. 
All right, how about the Bible credit? How about these churches that got perverted Bibles? There are many. What are you going to do with that one? If any man have ears to hear, let him hear. We as glad to see in church days today, we're in trouble. We think we're rich. We think we're great. We think we got the programs. We think we got the numbers. We think we got wonderful things. We think we got great things going on. And God says, you're miserable, naked, poor. But we can override that. Now, I'll tell you, I see on my Facebook, there's a lot of these revivals coming up in springtime and all that. And it's so funny because I will see, we're well, spring revival. We got Dr. Sussman. We got evangelist such and such. And you see their pictures. And we got this group coming. They're going to sing. And you see their pictures. I see no Bible verse. I see no Bible. I don't see anything about Jesus Christ. I don't even see what the, what the revival subject is all about. But I see your church. And I showed my church, uh, my, my daughter the other day. Uh, I said, hey, look at this one. We're going to have all day hot dogs. You know, all the hot dogs and all the fixing for everybody. And then we're going to have, we're going to have a gospel Easter hunt. And then after that, we are a Bible believing church. With hot dogs. With gospel egg hunt. Gospel, where do you find, oh yeah, I know you find the eggs in your scripture and all, where do you find that? I read Paul went out and preached. You know what Paul would do today, you know, at the malls, you got the Easter Bunny, you got the Santa Claus and all, Paul would walk up to the Easter Bunny and say, you're a star, and he'd be kicked out of the mall. And then they laughed to see, you won't believe this idiot that showed up in, at the mall the other day. You know, he was ragging on that, that Easter bunny. How oh, cruel. <laughs> Why, you want Jesus coming to your church and turn the tables over? <laughs> and he said unto them, here we go. We're still in the warning. We're still in light. Take heed to what you hear. That's a great thing right there. We can end with a period. A lot of churches say, take heed what you hear. With what measure you meet, that means it, it's what you take in, what you do. It, it, it's an illustration of dough and flour, how much you take in for cakes. It shall be measured to you. And to you that hear shall more be given. So, if you want a cake and you take a little taste teaspoon of this and a little teaspoon of that, don't expect a big cake. That's what a lot of Christians today. They'll say little as much as when God's in it and they don't do nothing. They're going to be at the judgment seat of Christ. Going to, oh, look at that. I'm going to get crowns. I'm going to get rewards. You never planted any seed. You're not going to get fruit. And we live in a world today. They got things, you know, you got this team and that team, the home team, the visiting team. And at the end, everybody gets a prize. Even if they lost. That's what the Christian thinks. If you plant Seed, you're going to get fruit, no matter what. You may not see that fruit, but there'll be fruit. If you plant no seed, you're not going to get no fruit. And saying, will you come to church and come to our church? That's not gospel seed. As we looked at earlier in Mark chapter 4, he didn't go out and say, go to church, come to church, go to church. There's a church, there's a church, there's a church, church everywhere, church, church. Oh, McDonald had a church, E-I-E-I-O. No, he went out and sold the word. And, and still stay in the context of chapter 4. When you put the seed out, the seed will come back and you may not see it. You'll see it in heaven, at least in effort. You know, there was, was it, 30, 60, and 100? And there was no rebuke to the 30. And yet the Baptist church, oh, we had 1,000 saved, we had 200 saved. You know, that's not what it is. And by the way, with a lot of the church today, it wasn't really salvation. You don't know. 
for unto he that hath, it shall be given. All right, you, you go out and plant tomato seeds, you're going to get tomatoes. You don't plant any seeds, you're not going to get nothing. Paul said, I planted, Paul was watered, God gave the increase. Now, you're not going to bring that fruit. There are many people, well, you know, we got these people saved, this guy, we got saved. You didn't do nothing. You just did what you were ordered to. You don't you don't bring nothing out of that ground. You don't bring anything. Out. And if you saved them, well, say hello to them at the at the Great White Stone Judgment. If you saved them, now if you want more from God and you take more from God, more will be given to you. And he that has not, from him shall be taken even. That which he had. Now we've already seen parable of the talents. Take this one talent and give it to him that's got the talent. You didn't put no effort. You didn't put no work. You didn't put no labor. You don't get it. It's that plain and simple. God doesn't give honor to unhonorable people. Now listen, you could plant seeds and let's say nothing happens. Well, you plant enough seed, something's going to happen. Even if they reject the seed, you did something. Now, you don't do anything at all. And there are Christians, they don't do anything at all. They're not going to get anything. There are churches out there. They got all the worldliness. They got all the ungodliness. They're not going to get nothing to judge the seed of Christ because they didn't do right. Again, that lad to see aspect is, oh, we're great, we're wonderful. How, and, no, you're not. And God rebukes. It's sorry to think that a church can go years and get involved in paganism. And God don't follow up on that paganism. It's sorry. And the thing is, once you get to the point, all right, I, I, I read my Bible, I pray and all that. Well, you know, maybe Jonah didn't go to hell. And you know what? That's it. Your growth, your giving by God has stopped because it's called the word unbelief. The Bible says the Israelites did not enter the promised land because of unbelief. That's how dangerous it is. They died in the wilderness. They were on the way to the promised land, but unbelief kept them out. Unbelief will keep you at the judgment seat of Christ. I'm talking to Christians. Unbelief will keep you from, well, how come I didn't get a crown? Well, go ask Esther. Go ask Santa Claus. And he said, so is the kingdom of God. That is the kingdom. You know, it, it's a spiritual kingdom. It's a holy kingdom by and of God. You've got the kingdom of heaven, which is a literal physical kingdom. You've got the spiritual kingdom. And one day they will be both together in Jesus. In the millennium. They're both not here now. As if a man should cast seed into a ground. Oh, here we here. We're stewing. See, we're stewing the aspect of the sower. Now, this is not the word of God. Okay, I know chapter four, the sower went out, he sold the word. But this is same principle seeding, but it's a different context. And should sleep. Now think about one step further for the, for the parable of the sower. He threw the word of God out there. Some has got 30, 60, and 100. And he should sleep and rise night and day. You go about, you get up, you sleep, get up, you sleep. And the seed should spring and grow up. Well, that's what happened to Paul, the, 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 the sower. 
his seed came up. Some of it was choked. Some of it died out. Some of it was proven. He knoweth not how. Okay, this is John chapter 3. This is the new birth that Nicodemus says, am I supposed to go back into my mother's womb all over again? Jesus like, you're you're a master of Israel, and you haven't got this understanding that's taught in the Old Testament scriptures, the rebirth of a nation, where God will give you a new heart and, and forgive you. You didn't get it? And this is the aspect I said earlier. There are people out there say, well, we got them saved. And no, you didn't. You don't know how. You don't know about the spiritual condition of another person. There's only three that know your salvation. God the Father, Satan, and you. And some people even doubt themselves. This is the aspect in Mark that we learn in, in Matthew and we learn in John chapter 3. Explain the new growth. I don't know. I... Receive Jesus Christ. I put my faith and trust in Jesus Christ. April 25th, 1987. My grandma's living room, 773 Broad Street. I knelt down at her coffee table and I asked Jesus Christ to save me with the King James Bible, Joe Whitmore, and Joe Caswell. No, I didn't. I don't know if I did. He said, well, what are you talking about? I may have been that I may have been saved the Sunday previous when I went to church and heard the message. I may have been saved that afternoon. I may have been saved right there in the pew. All you gotta do is believe. I may have been saved, believe it or not, in the Catholic Church. I believe Jesus Christ died. I believe Jesus Christ rose again. I believe Jesus Christ was virgin birth. I believe he, I never understood why they had him back on the cross. Maybe I was saved then. Oh, he said a prayer. And we say, you know, this is easy to believe. He said a prayer. Maybe he's not saved. Maybe you just planted and there needs to be watering. You cannot explain the spiritual birth. You cannot say that person saved, that person isn't saved. Now, according to James, if a person is saved, according to Paul, if a person has truly received Christ, you will see fruits. Jesus said, wherefore by their fruit you should know them. Now we cannot judge the spiritualness of but we can we can look at that fruit and say that's mean and nasty. That's disgusting. That ain't of God. I mean there were people in the parable of the sower, all right, they died out. The sun came out, they died out. No, don't go be teaching they got saved and they lost it. That's not scriptural. And what about the ones that came up and, and the thorns choked it because the cares and riches of the world? Don't say that they lost it because Paul told Timothy in one of the last letters that Paul writes, uh, you better warn those in church that are rich and want to be rich. And we looked at that. I've had many times in my early Christian life, I did some awful, terrible things. And I grew. How did I grow? I've grown a lot more today. Today, during the church message, there were things even I was repenting of, and there were things, you know what? I, I better bring that to focus. I better bring that before God. How does that happen? Okay, yeah, yeah, it's the Holy Spirit. Definitely, the Holy Spirit enlightens me. The Holy Spirit is my comforter, and he reminds me, he, he brings me to Jesus Christ. How? How can I tell somebody that God speaks to me without you saying, I heard an audio voice? How can I get out in the street and, and I pray beforehand and I get out in the street and I start preaching the Holy Spirit comes through my mouth and what I'm saying is not me, it's the Holy Spirit. How do you say that? And this is all the growth. And there are many men in the ministry, there are many men who are in the Bible college, Bible institute, and they think that that instructor, that man is going to teach. No, it's the Holy Spirit. And it's your conduct, it is your reaction to God and his scriptures, what we just read, with what? measure you meet 
And the minute you take that dough and you put leaven into that dough, disbelief, unbelief, well, scholarship, maybe it never happened. Maybe it happened this way. Maybe somebody else wrote it. You put that leaven in the dough. All right, stop it. Explain that to me. Okay. Do you know that you, you know, talk about leaven. Leaven is a type of sin. Do you know that you could take seed today and put it into cow poop and that will grow miraculously cow poop cow doo doo there's another word where I won't say it and you can get you, you go out at the end of, at the end of the winter you got your compost pile it's old and you, and, you, and you got good plants growing out of that, cow, out of that compost hmm. You mean dirt has been decayed, food has been decayed, and all that, and you got crops coming up, and you have twisted, you have perverted, you have sinned against God and His Word and His teaching, and you get nothing. You get to the point, even in your, you're saying, you know what, God, that's it. I, I, I don't want to be bothered. I'm going to live out in the world. I'm going to do what I want to do. I'm saved. That's good enough for me. Hallelujah. Glory to God. And that's it. And I'm telling you right now, I know by experience, and I think I'm going to go through another life change again. There's many times where God has, has taken everything away from me and started over. I think it's going to happen again. But there are times I backslid, and we're going down the road, and I'm thinking about Pilgrim's Progress. And you, you come to this junction. How many roads there are, but you have a junction of the right highway of the hill that goes up and it's just rugged and and, and you see easier paths and you take the easier path. And God says, OK, go ahead, I'll stay right here and wait for you. And you go that long path all around you, you load up stuff on you, you get scars, you get troubles and all you get, and you repent and you get right and you're back where God God don't go with you when you sin. I, I, I don't care what these people say. God don't, you know, you can't walk the footsteps of Jesus holding hands and kissing the devil. That's what a lot of churches believe. And what you need to learn from Mark chapter 4 is you better get on the good, solid ground. You better get productive and you better do right and you better have the right fertilizer and you better have the right attitude because unbelief and leaven which is sin i'm sorry i mean you may be a king james bible believing church and all that you may have the people you may have the but if you got leaven in your church you're wretched I'm not saying every I'm not saying there's the perfect church out there. I'm not saying there's a wonderful great church. There is none. But if sin is promoted by the church, all are welcome. Come. If you're a sodomite, come on in. If you don't know what sex you are, come on in. You're all welcome here. And come on in, S Star. We'll have egg rolling. We'll have Now that pastor's a sinner. The deacons are sinners, the treasurer is a sinner, the piano players are sinners, the choirs are sinners, and you're a sinner. But don't open. Don't open up your garden to everything and expect roses. And don't explain. You don't know about the Trinity, and you don't know about the spiritual growth. Now, don't say, okay, you know, there are different growth rates. There are different things you do in your Christian life, but how does it happen? I don't know. Everyone's different. Every man gets saved a different way by the same God's the same Savior. You must come to Calvary. And there are tons of in church, out of church, in a boat, out of a boat. In a, like I said, I was saved my grandma's coffee table. And the moment I got saved and we did that, I got yelled at because we moved her little decoration that was on the table and we had fingerprints on it. I got yelled at the day I got saved. But the Lord said, hey, I'm putting you in. 
Some get baptized, some don't get baptized. Some wait to get baptized. But your aspect of your Christian growth, don't ruin it. Confess your sins. If the devil puts something in you about, about you know, a belief in the Bible or something like that, fight it. Confess it. And grow. If you don't believe it, if you find it hard to believe it, all right, okay, God said it so, and I'll read it again next time, and I'll read it again next time. And <clears throat> For the earth bringeth forth fruit of herself. Okay, we know that. There's all kinds of fruit in the earth. First the blade, then the ear, after the full corn in the ear. Now, that's not corn as in what you find in America. That is wheat. Maize, as we call the, the, the corn on the cob and all that. They didn't know about that then. It's just interesting how wheat and our corn has the same meaning. But that's not, you know, corn you take popcorn. It's wheat. So... How do you take a seed and throw it on the ground and next thing you know, here comes a blade? And then the ear. <laughs> and then you harvest it. You take a, a seed in the ground, all right? How does that seed know which way is up? What's gravity? Okay, explain gravity. They can. How does the evolutionary process tell you that seed that's in darkness underground? Where up is. Where if you are a scuba diver. And you go in depths where it's dark. You carry coins in your pocket. Or a rock. And when you get down to such a depth. or It doesn't even have to be dark. You just get, just get to a certain depth. That you don't know which way is up. You take that rock out and you drop it. And you go opposite from where that rock went. That's how you find up. Does a sea take a rock and drop it? No. Have you ever dug in the ground and found an upside down tree? No. Ever gone to somewhere in the woods and see, you know, coming out of the ground roots of trees? No. And yet, this evolutionary process, this is all supposed to happen perfect. How do you explain poison ivy? It's God. And he said unto him, and this is things that they understand. They understand harvesting. The whole one of the central things of Israel is harvest, grapes, olives, figs, wheat, barley. Wherefore, unto, wherefore shall I liken the yeah, wherefore shall I liken the kingdom of God? Or what comparison shall we compare? All right, so okay, we're talking about the, the kingdom. Okay, what is like the kingdom of God? Now we're going to get into a very misconception. And I know this is talk about faith too, but we're not talking about faith now. We're talking, God says, uh, God, Jesus said, all right, the kingdom of God is like, which is here in the millennium, is like a grain of mustard seed. All right, take a little seed of mustard. Here, we're talking about planting again. Which when it is sown in the earth, put in the earth, they were still talking about planting, is less than all the seeds that be in the earth. And the thing is, it's not that it's the smallest seed. There are much smaller. Is what is the outcome of a mustard seed? It it makes mustard, and its leaves are cooking. And there's not much. I can get probably more from a tomato than I can from a mustard. I can get more from a cucumber. Than I, but I mean, it's less extreme and all that. But look at the mustard. And why he says the mustard, who's really thinking about a mustard? You got a whole nation of grapes. You ever see some of those grapes? You ever see the description of those grapes? You got a whole of figs, of olive oil, wine from the grapes. I mean, there's all kinds of, uh, the mustard seed. 
Really? That's nothing. You take the person that you in your church least esteem. Paul says, you got a controversy. Take the person least esteem in your church and have him be your judge. You realize the person in your church you, uh, who he, people probably don't know who he is or she. That may be the one whose prayers are making things happen. You know, you got great soul winners out there. Hundreds are getting saved and, and people are getting baptized and, and, and everybody's learning their Bible lesson. And it may be because that one little person you don't even recognize, you don't even know, sitting at pew at home praying. The little mustard seed. There's less than all the seeds that be in there. But when it is sown, it grows up, and we just what we just talked about the the the, the, the growth. We, I mean, we don't know how it happens. So what we're talking about now is we're talking about growth. Explain growth. You say, well, you know, everybody becomes a fruitful Christian. No, I say no regard to birth defects. Okay, please. Let me say this with caution. But there are spiritual retards in the Christian assembly. They don't grow. They don't produce nothing. They don't do nothing because they are spiritually retarded and mostly by choice. Now, if a child is born with physical difficulty, physical impairments, all that, okay, that's another story. We all have in salvation and being a Christian, we have the same Lord God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who is God, who suffered and died, was buried and rose again the third day, who died on Calvary, came out of the empty tomb of Joseph Arvine's tomb. We believe in the same Jesus, Christians I'm talking about. How come one can grow to be successful and one may not grow at all? Why will there be Christians at the judgment seat of Christ? Okay, they're there. And ashes. And there'll be Christians' rewards and crowns. It's the same Jesus. But if you're going to plant that mustard seed, don't expect a tomato. And a lot of pastors and churches and Sunday school teachers, they will have a seed, and I'm talking about a Christian, in their pew, in their seed, and they expect that to be a big, great, big palm tree. No. You might have a raspberry bush. It might, that, that person there, he may not take the storms like a palm tree will take it. He might be an oak. He may be a maple. He may be one of them little tiny plants that, you know, he's just a plant. He may be a decorative, maybe a flower. He may be a dandelion. You know, when a dandelion then turns white and you blow all the seeds around, and you didn't realize you just angered your parents. Because <laughs> when you blow that thing as a child, you planted seeds all around. Hey, there's some Christians like that. There are all kinds of seeds. A coconut has to soak in the ocean for it to produce a coconut tree. The Connecticut, the, Connecticut, the, the California redwood trees, their seeds have to be burnt. Understand the wildfire. Why are the wildfire? Because those seeds need to be burnt by fire to produce. This is all in the world. Listen, we can take Mark chapter 4 and we can go into, I think it's botany. And we can study every seed of every plant. Look at all the messages we could get. You can take trees and you can find every type of Christian. Some, seed, some trees don't produce any fruit at all. They're showy. They look good. 
Some trees you got to cut and trim to produce their fruit. Type of Christians. There are some seeds that don't work. You, you can bring the seeds from New England, bring them down to Florida. They're not going to work. There are some seeds they call preannual and annual. Some of them, they come up every year. Some of them, you know what? Here they are. And that's it. Isn't that the, poor, the, the, the parable of the sower? And becomes greater than all the herbs. And mustard has that taste. <laughs> Whew. And shooteth out great branches, so that the fowls of the air. Now, now the fowls of the air. Let's go back to the beginning of the, the uh, verse four, Mark four four. The fowls of the air came and devoured it. They ate the seed. Okay, scripture with scripture. And don't say I'm I'm reading to anything and I'm looking look at verse 15. And these are by the way, these are by the wayside when the word is sown. All right, we're not talking about the word where we're at, but right now where the word is sown, but when they have heard Satan cometh immediately. Satan's a type of bird, so when we come down to where we're at. Greater than herbs, so the, the fowls of the air may lodge under the shadow of it. So, in Matthew, we read a parable about the, the tares and the wheat. Here's the same thing right now. Why are there evil, wicked people, unsaved people in the world? Because they're, they're part of the kingdom of God. They've been planted by the devil. Their father is the devil, John 8, 44, and they produce devils. And they happen to get the same blessings Christian. You know, you know there are Christians praying, there are Christians seeking God for food, for water, for comfort, for protection, and the wicked, unsaved benefit from the Christian in their prayer. And with many such parables, Thank he the word, the word, parables of the Lord, them. So there are many such parables. Does Mark record them all? No. John tells us at the end of the Gospel of John, there are many such things that were done by Jesus that have not been written. There is more in the Gospels of each Gospel. But it is not the complete. Why is Luke so much more than Mark? Why is Matthew so much more than John? And John is so much more than, than the other three gospels. It's because John says, hey, we couldn't write all that Jesus done. And Mark says, hey, there are other, par there are other parables he spake that day. I'm not going to record them. Mark took down what is important. And see, as far as Mark chapter 4, he now maybe Mark was a farmer. Maybe Mark worked through, because he's seen it in this chapter, hey, everything about planting. Now, we know from the other Gospels that Jesus spoke about fishing. Jesus spoke about, you know, a builder builds a house, a, a warrior is going to sit out to war. He speaks about many things, and Mark centers his attention here with farming. That may have been his career. Many other such parables thank he the word unto them as they were able to hear it. But without a parable thank he not unto them, and when they were alone, the disciples and Jesus, he spun all things. So in the nation of Israel, they get parables because you know what? We are in chapter four and we've already seen the people are after him. The Pharisees are after him. The scribes are after him. Everybody, they've already, in the aspect of Mark chapter four, outside the birth of Jesus and is 13 years old, we've already seen that the servant of God has been rejected. 
in America today. It's not the servant that's been rejected. It's the idea of servanthood. Slavery has been rejected. Friend, okay, it's terrible. I am not going to allude to the fact is of slavery or anything like that, but it is a Bible doctrine is if they really did so bad and there were some that did wicked to their, ser their servants or slaves, if they really did so wicked and poor to their servants or slaves, there would have never been any. And the very fact is, in the early South, and in some cases in the North, the colored man from Africa that was brought here for work, can I say to an aspect, was not brought to the red man's God, the Native American, because he had gods. They were brought to the white man's God, the name of Jesus. And you can find in many cases the hardship of the, of the slaves and all that. You will find their own Christian hymns and triumphant hymns of praising the white man that saved them. And I'm not talking about Harry Baker Stroh. I, my eyes have seen the glory. He didn't see nothing. The only glory that you saw was the Northern Army coming down. But servitude is throughout the scriptures. That's why one of the things the Bible was hated, and it took a servant to plant the seed. Well, if you don't want to be a servant and you hate servitude on that, you're not going to serve God. That's one of the problems with Christianity. You know, I'm not going to do that. Okay. Did not one of those men say, well, I know they're austere, and then you, you reap where no one so and That's the complete attitude today of the African American, mostly. I ain't going to do that. There's the attitude of Christians. Say, I ain't going to do that. I'm going to bring them to church and let my pastor do it. I, I had one of the churches, the people, you know, they had somebody who, who needed to know about Jesus. They would call the pastor at 3 o'clock in the morning. Pastor, I got this guy who needs to know. Uh, what about you? That ain't my job. Oh, wow. And then today I see reverse. Pastors are not doing their job. You ought not to be having Christian counseling people. It should be your pastor's job. I had to say that, but 